Okay. So now we're back here again for night hacking from Munich. So hi, what's your name? I never met you before. <laughs> yeah, we just been on motorcycles for two <laughs> weeks together, sharing rooms. So I'm Steve. <laughs> I'm the Java community manager for Oracle, and um, also the, the the regular interviewer for um, night hacking. But I I think we might um, have have a qualified candidate to replace me. <laughs> Um, and I, I brought some toys with me too. I mean, the sewing machine was wonderful. Tony's yeah, sewing machine. Sewing. So, okay, watch what, that. Uh, watch what that did video. You to show us. But I brought, I brought this guy. It is a um, oh, 3D that? printed gaming console, and it runs with a Raspberry Pi inside of it. Um, it has a touch screen and um, buttons. The buttons are GPIO controlled. Um, you can see all of the Raspberry Pi ports for USB and Ethernet. Um, the SD card in front is the hard drive and stores the games on it. So it's you know it's it's like like a little Nintendo DS, but and what language does it run? Ah, yes, it runs Java. So it wow. runs a Java-based emulator called Half NES, which I've tuned to get cool. about 60 frames per second, give or take. <laughs> Depends on what game you pick. Um, Speaking of, speaking of games, does anyone have a favorite game? Mario. 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 That's, that's, that's the right answer, actually, because that's one of the games I have on here. <laughs> Super Mario Brothers. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got Super Mario Brothers running on it. And you want to you give it a try? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, come over here. Oh, 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 that was, that was bad. Okay, one more. That was, that little... <laughs> my hand. No, 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 that's, um, the Pi decided to reboot randomly. And it's, because it's restarting now. No, it's not because of your karma. It's, it's probably because this, <laughs> this particular <laughs> device has been all over Germany mm -hmm. and touched by thousands and thousands of people. It has been played a lot. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> Actually, I, I blame I blame the SD cards, which get horribly corrupted on the Raspberry Pi when you don't shut it down and reboot it properly. Um, if you properly turn it on and off, it's it's wonderful. So we're gonna let it we're gonna let it boot up again. Maybe it'll work again. We'll we'll see. We're gonna let it boot up again, and then we'll see if we if we have a working retro Pi. Yeah, typical. That, that's how you fix Windows boxes, right? You exactly. <laughs> turn them off, turn them on, and usually they start working again. But I have I have a picture here of the electronics I can show. I won't touch any electronics in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this. Yeah, 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 on the back of the case, and um, I specifically stuck the the daughter board there, which has all the LED lights, and I did little cutouts in the plastic so the lights shine through on the on the back of the case. Um, also, the, the, if you noticed all the text on here, that took a while to getting. Clean, clean 3D. You oh, notice the details. <laughs> yes, that sounded like a question. I think I think we have somebody who wants to ask a question and possibly get a giveaway. So so what was the what was the question you're asking? How much? Yeah. Okay. So it seems like I have a lot of free time. So the question is, do I have a lot of free time? Okay. So I think you can answer that, Sebastian. Do I have a lot of free time? I don't think so. No, no, I have no free really. time. Okay, so I have an interesting story about this. Um, because you're probably wondering when I found time to do this case, because I'm always busy traveling around. Um, and there's a, there's a reason my book is, is dedicated to uh, my family, my, my um, wife and two daughters. Um, so it was, I just got back from Brazil, right? I was driving around Brazil on a big night hacking tour, typing the book in the car. <laughs> while traveling around Brazil, bet really bad idea. You get um, car sick with Bruno, with your Brazilian driving the steering wheel, you get car sick very quick. So I, I need, needless to say, I was behind schedule on the book, and I had exactly two weeks, well, I had exactly one week <laughs> to finish designing and printing the 3D case from scratch. Um, and that's not enough. No, no, it's not enough. No, you're not, not your turn yet, be quiet. 
So we're still answering your question, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. One one question at a time. So um, what happened was I I worked day and night to try to design and print the 3D case. So during the day I would um, I would work on. Let's let's switch to a 3D printing slide because we're talking about 3D printing. This is this is what the actual case looks like. Um, with all the different parts laid out, there's uh, 11 parts in total. So I was I would design in the modeling software during the day, um, and then at night I would print out a version of the case, um, and I would repeat this every day, like you know, modeling for like you know, 16, 18 hours, sleep for a few hours, That's let the 3D printers time. run. Yeah, you save time. Efficient. Printers work while you're sleeping. Actually, I I was using two printers to simultaneously print different parts <laughs> of the case, so I could speed it up as well. Um, and I ran out of time. One week was not enough to design a case from scratch. I don't know why I ever thought it would be possible. But we had a trip for Disneyland planned. <laughs> um, and it was, like the, it was like a few days before the trip. My wife's like, are you sure you're going to be OK? Oh, yeah, yeah, it'll work. It was like two days before Disneyland. Like, that doesn't look like it's a finished project. Are you sure? Well, maybe I can bring the printer with me on the trip. <laughs> And then finally, it was the day before the trip, and I'm like, I need an extra week. Maybe we're going to postpone that trip. So they actually, my family you gave up. Are happy with that? No, no. My family gave up a um, summer vacation so that this book could, could be made possible. Um, so that's why the book's dedicated to them. And that's also the answer to your question. So I don't have any free time, but somehow I found two weeks to finish the 3D printed case. And um, that's, that's how this project got finished. OK, prize. <laughs> OK, now you wanted to ask something, Miroslav. You can. Oh. But you don't, you, don't, you, don't get a, you don't get a prize for forgetting your own question. <laughs> and you need more prizes. Clearly, I don't, think, I don't think you have one of Tony's pens. Tony's pens. Tony will give you, Tony will give you a magical pen. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, we we should. That's not very happy. <laughs> Boop. Here you go. Reboot. We'll see how he, if he gets happier. Okay. So, what else would you like to know about the project? Well, what kind of games can it run? Actually, when you say it's a free tool pie gaming. Console yeah. Okay. So it runs Nintendo emulation system games, and. Um, for those of you, uh, did, did any of you guys have Nintendos growing up? Yeah, Nintendo, one, one of these guys. So this actually, it, it was a really popular console. Um, so the NES sold 61 million units up to, I think it was five years ago. You could bring your, um, you, could, you could have Nintendo in Japan repair your Super Famicom. That was the Japanese version of the Nintendo. And they would actually do warranty repairs on Super Famicoms up to five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so extremely, <laughs> extremely popular console. It ran those little cartridges like that. And it, um, the, the emulator that runs on this will run any valid NES game. So you can play you know, Super Mario, Zelda, um, Metroid. Um, you can play this one. Ninja Gaiden, and anyone beat this one? Yeah, yeah. So it's called it's called Ninja Gaiden. It's it's impossible to beat. Almost impossible. Top five hardest Nintendo games to beat. Um, somehow, I beat it, but I think it involved um, wasting two weeks worth of electricity because you can't turn the game off. The what? Oh, the, the, the game itself, like the Mario Brothers game, is that open source? Okay, so that's a good question. You get a prize for that as well. Um, no, so Nintendo has not open sourced their code. So I was very careful to only pick games for the RetroPie, which are actually available, um, which, I have, which I own the ROM of. So all the games on this device, I actually own the, own the physical ROM for the game, and I do not condone um, pirating or stealing or downloading games you which, which you do not own. That's, that's bad. Support, support gaming companies which made games 30 years ago and still haven't released the license for them. 
Speaking of the uh, source code, I'm interested in how does that work? Uh, because originally it probably won't be Java, right? So what uh, are you actually running here? Yeah, so I'm actually running Java. I'm running this project, half, half NES. And most, most people think emulation is not fast enough on, on Java. But this isn't true. Like, Java is actually really fast. The just-in-time compiler is amazing. Um, you can actually run, like, really high-performance code on it. Um, it's, it's working again, so let's pass working this around. Again, yeah. so we yeah. can... We'll try, we'll try Mario again. Mario, 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 Mario. No, no, no. We, we have to... This is, this is part of the testing process. Is, can should I increase I? the volume? We would like to hear it. Can I increase? No, I can't increase the volume. This, this is as loud as it gets, but we can, we can have it make noise. All right, so it's... It sounds familiar somehow. <laughs> Classic Mario. Okay, see if you can give it a shot. Give it a try. Oh, what <laughs> happened? <laughs> it's definitely you. No, 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 that's, that's, that's a... There must be there must be a wire short in here somewhere. Static electricity? But through the plastic case, you'd think plastic would insulate no, against static. Yeah. Oh wow. So let's blame the floor. <laughs> Your floor. And Sorry, Tom. Okay, so this is the last <laughs> night hacking tour here. All right, all right, all right. So, <laughs> so Miro, touch the tripod. Tripod, tripod. Touch the tripod. Did you get zapped? No, zapped. All right, touch the metal box on the, the, that little metal. <laughs> Are you zapped <laughs> yet? <laughs> okay, now, now give it another try. No, it works. No, no, it works. Okay, you, you're probably right. It's probably static electricity. And we can see Maybe I need to shield, yeah, shield it better. Because this, this happened once at um, when I was planning to get Java Land, and I handed it to a guy, and he started playing, and it immediately reset. So no. probably, probably the same sort of thing, because that was a carpeted floor, too, oh, where I you jump? could get static electricity. I have a question. How can I jump? Yeah, I made it. <laughs> 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 so I well, the games back then were more difficult than today. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question what as well. What kind of well. Uh, LCD screen is that? We just had the question. Okay. So, the answer to what kind of LCD screen is it? It's, it's a 4.3 inch um, TFT screen from Adafruit. And you can buy this and you can install it inside the case, kind of like uh, the case, 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 like, like this. This, this is the, the connector of the screen. Uh -huh. um, so it hooks up over that a standard. It doesn't look like HDMI. What do you use to, to hook it up? Yeah, so LCD panels have funky, uh, it's like 20 pin connectors or something funky. And they use these ribbon cables. The ribbon cables are horrible. Like threading a ribbon cable through mm. the case is like not much fun. But it, it's, not, it's not too bad. You just coil it with your fingers and then slide it through. And I put big openings to make it relatively easy to do. So I, you can reliably do this without any tools. Actually, the whole case is designed so you don't need screwdrivers, you don't need um, special hinges, you don't need any special mechanical parts. You just 3D print it and you snap it together, like um, kind of like Legos or you know construction set type stuff. But it it stays together pretty rigid. It doesn't come apart easily. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. Why don't we run Mame? Because nobody's helped me to run Mame on this. Are you going to help me, Tony? For our, for our, um, how, how, how can I help you with that? For, for the, for the, 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 the large version of this we're going to make for Java one that we talked about earlier today. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. There are some games that I want to play. And I'm a Nintendo <laughs> generation, so. Yeah, so, uh, there also, I was chatting with one of the guys from, um, oh my god, which conference was I at? J Focus. Um, and he, he has a Commodore emulator in Java. In Java. And he, we were going to try running it on this as well. I know the first level. 
Nice. Let's All right, so if anyone else wants to try this, feel free to go ahead. Um, it's tethered nice. here for battery, and so touch the camera it. before you touch this <laughs> so you don't shock it. Um, try, try the box on the side. might be better. That, yeah, that box. Yeah, if that doesn't, if you're grounded now. You can, you can point the camera at, at him flying. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can you can ignore your I think you're not on screen right now, so you you can play happily. <laughs> okay, and then some other Yeah, poor poor Miroslav. Okay. When you say it's um written in Java, can you also show it um right here when it's not uh, running on the Raspberry Pi? Just to show our audience. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, that's a good question. So this is the actual source base running in NetBeans. Um, well, that's not it. That's the IoT surfboard I was working with on Venetius, but um, this this is the actual code base, and it's a it's a pretty nicely broken up code base. So you have like classes for the APU, the audio processing unit. That's that's an excellent question. So I I can, but maybe I don't feel like it. <laughs> Yeah, so here's the APU class. Um, CPU class, so this one controls the um, the processor emulation. Um, there's, there's special things for different games, for mappers. They use a PPU and a bunch of um, ROM mappers for different types of games. So here's the, the mapper code. Um, so I spent a lot of time optimizing the code base because originally it ran at six frames per second, and that's not that it's mm -hmm. not that great. But now it runs really fast, really fast. Okay. Really fast. Um, so this is on desktop, mm -hmm. running um, any of the number of games which I oh, let's do. Let's do let's, do. let's do. Let's do Zelda because we, we haven't played pinball. No, no. It, that's actually that's a really bad version of pinball. You you don't <laughs> register your name. <laughs> yeah. How, what's the, uh, there we go, Steve, no, I can't backspace. You can't okay, type with we're, normal keyboard. We're, this, is, this is horrible, yeah, like, you, you remember this from the, oh from yeah, the. Oh yeah, that was always, oh, I just abbreviated, I don't have the time. <laughs> and where's the, where's the start button? And probably, right? Yeah, how do I, how do I press start on this thing? There, there's probably a start button somewhere. On the keyboard, there's a magical. Oh my God! Oh well, <laughs> now we've now we're gonna load a different game that doesn't <laughs> have an annoying. It runs better. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't have an annoying. Let's do Metroid. Okay, so that was easier. So Metroid, Metroid's pretty cool. This is one of my my all-time favorite games because it was it was one of the first games which was non-linear. So um, you can go anywhere you want in the game, but you need power-ups to get there. So like when you get to the the was that that was Super Metroid yeah, yeah Super words. Super Metroid required that you get the the ball first to go through here but yeah yeah the thirty years ago is about is about right <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're okay so then you see like like I get to here and then I can I can go here but then oh, oh I'm no. stuck oh no I'm stuck so like the whole game is like this it has little like puzzle moments where you have to figure out the power-up item and the way to use it to get through here. So does anyone know how you get through this little spot? You remember? Remember the secret from 30 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no cheating. No cheating. This is, this is, this was before the internet <laughs> where you could look up cheat codes. Look up all the cheats, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no. So, like, like in most games, you always go right first. So they know you go right first. So they hide the power up on the left, and you get the ball. You get the ball, and then and then now you have the ball, and you can you can now brawl through little little gaps. Like the remember that wall had a little gap below, so you can go through. Yeah. So you can you can play all these wonderful games. We could actually um, speed it up as well and have it. I think it can run a few thousand frames per second on a desktop computer. Which is not too bad, so we can go really fast. Um, but on the Raspberry Pi, Raspberry we only Pi. get about 60 frames per second. And you mentioned some performance problems. So how do you get around these? 
Yeah, so here's, here's a list of things I tried. This is mostly scraped, scraped off of my um, contribu contribution list to the GitHub repo. Where is it? Maybe. Here. So um, one of the things I changed, the original version used Swing. And I changed it to use another UI framework. What could that be? What could that be? Who what knows that? What you? Oh, very good. You, I, you got a prize for that answer. JavaFX. Pick another prize, Miroslav. One more. One more. Yeah. So, um, especially on the Raspberry Pi, JavaFX. Well, even on the desktop, it's faster. But on the Raspberry Pi, it's much, much, much faster. Why is that? Could you explain this? Because you can directly go to the frame buffer and bypass X windows, and you also get GPU acceleration. So. Um, yeah, maybe maybe we need a Duke script version that runs on JavaFX on on ARM for high performance, super high performance. <laughs> <laughs> well, browsers are not that good on mobile either. The browser performance. Yeah, um, that's actually that's actually a big problem. Like like it, we take for granted that. Um, we're, we're getting off on a digression here about Duke script. We take for granted that browsers are really fast on these devices, right? Mm -hmm. So if you open a web browser on like an iPhone or an Android phone, the browser is really, really fast. When you do the same thing on um, a Raspberry Pi or on any of these small embedded platforms, the browsers are horrible. They're slow and they're buggy and they're just like hideous. Um, and the, the problem is they, you know, when you get into these small mobile chipsets, you have to tune for the graphics device, the graphics chipset, and the specific performance of the device. Um, so Apple and Google obviously care about their mobile platforms quite a bit, and they do lots of performance tuning. So if you have exactly the same GPU that's inside one of these, you'll get good performance out of their custom browser implementations, either their custom browser hacks plus the right GPU. If you pick a plain vanilla like um, WebKit or some um, standard browser, and you try to run on small embedded devices, it just it's horrible. It runs absolutely hideously. So JavaFX is a really good option because it lets you do high performance graphics stuff that's direct GPU accelerated. Um, so that was one. Uh, yeah, well we see a lot of performance bottlenecks. Other performance bottlenecks, yeah. Which one actually did, did help the most of these? Oh, actually, it's it's the one which. You, you would least expect, which was these bitwise okay, helper functions. Uh, yeah, well, I can show you that. Already said it. I, I can show that in the code. Um, yeah, so yeah. everywhere, everywhere in the code. Can we have an example? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for one. Everywhere in the code, if I can find the stupid PPU, PPU <laughs> code. Why can't I? Why can't I find the PPU code? Oh, it's in the UI package. Do 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 do. Let's let's look at GUI impl. So um, like a lot of this code does bit shifting all over the place um, to kind of set things. And um, well, video is probably the right one. Enter NTSC Comer. Why can I not find the PPU? Uh, because it, it's up there. <laughs> OK, yeah, so let's make it bigger so you guys can see it as well. So, so you can see all over the, the PPU code, there's um, lots of little bit bit manipulation type stuff. Um, and this is pervasive through all the code. And it, it used to use, uh, rather than this, where it's using um, bit flags. Um, so AND and OR operations and bit shifts are all like highly optimized and very fast. Like as a processor level, it's like one instruction to do one of these things. Um, but instead, it would call a method, and it would pass in the, the register, and it would pass in the the bit number, like you know, bit eight or bit three. Like this, in this case, would pass in bit three, and it would say, you know, set bit three, or clear bit three, um, and we do this everywhere in the code consistently. So it's more readable. More readable in terms of clean code. It's very clean, <laughs> but the problem is that it can't be inlined effectively by the compiler, and and then doing one method dispatch for each bit operation just destroys your performance. So this this like doubled the speed or tripled the speed like immediately. Just and it's it's actually easy to go back and forth. 
Um, so I just wrote a regular expression which combed the code base and then fixed it all in one swoop. Uh, but you know, stuff like that. That was the biggest performance mm -hmm. benefit. And there's actually something here which isn't a performance benefit too, because um, it turns out that don't don't do that. Don't do use on safe. Yeah, that's why it's called unsafe. And people yeah. still do it. Yeah. Now I I complain I of being removed in Java nine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I tried it just for the heck of it, and it it actually. And I it can didn't help much. No, it it um. It was not very helpful. Um, so in the CPU RAM, it does it does all this funk with um. Yeah, see so here's an unsafe. Yeah, so this is how you get the unsafe. Don't do this at home. This is how you, <laughs> this is how you get the unsafe, and then you. And I was using it to um to do some array access. Um. So to um to get the base offset of an array. And then to directly um, set um, bits in an array in the memory, in the memory. Um, and the idea was that if I avoid the array bounds lookups and some of the array funk going on, then it would speed up performance. What? It doesn't show the code, I guess. Why does it do that? Oh, it doesn't show the code. Well, it's showing the code. Yeah, but you have oh no no no! Don't worry about that because I'm mixing here, You're so I can see both. what's. What's going on? Yeah, yeah, we we have this this fancy magic mix, fancy magical mixer. Um, yeah, so basically, I, I I have an unsafe version, which uses I think this this might be an unsafe version, and I have a regular version, and I tested them both, and the regular version is just as fast because the JIT compiler optimizes everything out. So don't don't use unsafe; it actually doesn't help. It's it's a waste of your time. Yeah, and it's going to go away soon, and your code won't work on. <laughs> future exactly. Java versions, and then you'll cry. You'll cry to the chief architect, and he will break you on the mailing list, and you'll feel horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool project. Thanks for showing that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any other questions about this cool retool pie hacking, uh, hacking and gaming project? Let me show you guys where you can um, find it. Oh yeah, exactly. What? What if uh, we want to print our own? Printer, 3D printer. Um, you you don't need to buy a 3D printer to print it. You could borrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know someone who owns a 3D printer. But what if I don't know somebody who, who owns a 3D printer? Yes, yeah, so you can often that? borrow a printer from a maker space. Are there, is there a maker space in, in Munich? I, I guarantee there's a Munich ma maker space. There, every, every, every big city in the world has a maker space which has some 3D printers you can borrow. No, no, not the not the Oracle headquarters. Um, typically, universities also have 3D printers, and you can go to universities like like I know, I happen to know that the Frankfurt Technology University has several people with 3D printers who might let you borrow it. Um, you can also print it online with Shapeways or other 3D printing services. So you can set it out to be printed, and then it comes back. Or you could just you could just break down. And say, I want to be cool too, and you could buy um, one of these. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, you could you could call me too, and I would I would probably not be at home, or I'd be in the middle of a presentation, and I'd ignore you. <laughs> okay, so yeah, yeah, this this is my 3D printer, the Ultimaker too. Um, why, why the Ultimaker? It's the good thing. The good thing about the Ultimaker is, well, it works. And when it doesn't work, you can take it apart and make it work. So my first support case, um, it was actually it was missing a little, a little spacer for the Bowden tube, um, and I, it printed without it. So it actually printed successfully without the spacer. But I noticed the spa spacer was missing, and I emailed support in the Netherlands, and I said, "Hey guys, you know I got a new printer, and it's missing a part." And they're like, "Okay, well, we'd be happy to send you the part and ship it from the Netherlands. That's fine." They said, but you, yeah, but you could print it yourself. And they, s cool. they sent me the file with the um, design for the little missing piece, and I printed on the printer, and I patched it, and that night I had fixed the problem. That's very nice. And so you can just like, go on. Yeah, yeah. so they also have a, they have a big community of folks um, 
who like on the forums, they create extensions and mods for the printers. A lot of the, the modifications have gone back into the printer design. So they have Ultimaker 2 Plus with a new extruder. And it's an extruder, like a ge double geared extruder that was actually designed by the community. Uh, yeah. Rep, rep wrap, yeah, rep wrap. So, yeah. So the rep, the goal of the rep wrap project is to make self-replicating machines. Yeah. So you can have device which will j build itself or another device that can build <laughs> devices. <laughs> and the Ultimaker was actually originally a rep wrap printer. It was the rep wrap Bowden tube printer. And then they built a company around it afterwards. Um, so if you look for Bowden tube style printers, the, the, the Bowden tube is the big plastic tube around the top. And the unique thing about Bowden tube printers is the print head's very light because the motor is in the back. You see on the right picture, there's that little black box is the motor. Um, so that's what pushes the plastic through the tube. And the head, which has the hot end on it and heats stuff up, has no motor on it. So it's lighter. So Bowden tube printers are very fast because the print head is light and they the, probably the fastest 3d printer of all the all the standard fff t style printers but it, it has its its own disadvantages like it's it's more difficult to print with flexible materials since you're pushing through a tube with pressure at the back end mm -hmm. and you said you can take it apart so uh, is it do you have the instructions it's kind of like open source yeah so they've actually they've open sourced the whole printer design as well so oh. you can you can see all the the files for um, like the um, for doing the cutouts from acrylic and for all, all the mechanical parts and everything is you know fully open source for the design. Um, so you could you could build one yourself, but you're better off just buying it from them because mm -hmm. they actually assemble it and make it work. Yeah. Print a printer. Yeah, not not quite yet. We we haven't quite gone to self-replicating 3D printers. You but need all the metal parts as well. Right? Yeah, you need you need motors and you need in th in this case getting getting um you need metal rods as well and and metal screws. It's there's a whole bunch of things you need. Yeah. But Okay, cool. Now we have a 3D printer and uh, how do we print it? Where can we get the instructions for your project? Ah, very good question. So, you can either get them on Thingiverse where um, you can see the full instructions, or you can get them from uh, this guy, the um, Raspberry Pi with Java Book, which I, I wrote for McGraw-Hill. Um, but my, my luggage is kind of full. I have to offload this book. Can you guys help me out? <laughs> Who wants to have a Raspberry Pi <laughs> programming with Java Book? Everyone well, wants one. It's not that simple. Let's let's uh, let's say you have to answer a question, and you have to answer a hard question. A hard because question. Because it's really cool. It's not yeah, a, um, yeah. a simple giveaway. Okay. Can you ask a hard question on your project? And a hard question about my project. It? Okay. Yeah. So, I'll I'll show you guys a picture. Yeah, and and if you've if you've watched the stream, you might know the answer, so that would help as well. But that shows dedication, as well. Um, okay, so for the um, the buttons in the case, I only had um, <coughs> six GPIO pins available because I'm using this Kippa board, and I um, need eight for an NES controller. See, because there's, you know, A, B, select, start, and then four directional arrows. So, um, my solution was to use some diodes to connect the left and right directional arrows so that when you press start, it um, triggers both left and right. And when you press select, it triggers up and down. And that way, I don't need dedicated GPIO pins for select and start. They just simultaneously press those directions, which are not a valid input. So that was, that was my little hack um, I did in the hardware design. And it works, it works you know, fairly well. Um, does that make sense so far? Everyone following? Yeah, yeah. Okay, there's a question that's gonna come. So why, 
why did I choose to use diodes in the circuit rather than resistors or capacitors or, or other random things I could have thrown in there? <laughs> could have something to do with electricity, yeah, very good. So that's not quite the answer, it's a bit too vague. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's, that, that's not enough points. It's points for trying, maybe you can pick another thing out of the bag, but not enough points for, for getting a book. Anyone want to anyone take a stab at how, how do diodes work? What do they do? Okay, so resistors have resistance <laughs> there th yeah there there is there is resistance across diodes but it's not really electrically it's not really interesting from a circuit design standpoint unless you're you have very slow tolerances okay well let, let it's more like how how they work think of that. Let, let me ask you a different question if i didn't have diodes in the circuit what would happen Short circuit, yeah. yeah. So then, what what do the diodes do? Let let, let him talk. Oh yes, winner. Okay, you, you win the book. So so yeah, so diodes are single directional circuit elements. They let current flow one direction and they block current flowing the other direction. Yeah, give him a round. Yeah, round of applause. Very good. Very good. Um, so what you want in this circuit is you don't, you don't really want the current from the left and the right flowing through to trigger the opposite button, but you do want the current from the start flowing through and triggering left and right. Um, the, technically, if you look at the direction of the diodes, it looks backwards. Like, the, I think the, uh, I can't remember which way it goes, but anyway, the, they, the, that little black line there shows the direction the diode works. And the reason, the reason it looks backwards is because all of my buttons are um, high off, low on. So when you, when you actually have power passing through the circuit, it's off. So the diodes, the diodes are, they're not preventing current through, they're letting negative, uh, anyway, you, you get the idea. It's like the reverse logic of what you think it should be. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the sort of fun stuff that happens when you skip Disneyland as you you end up playing with diodes and 3D printers, and um, your family forgives you at some months down the road, and your book gets published. Yeah, so for everyone who is not attending here and answering cool questions, you can also get the book, right? And do no, your own maybe, things. Maybe, maybe, maybe you can nice. buy it. I, I've, heard it's, I've heard it's on sale. <laughs> you <laughs> that very good. <laughs> my, I think my publisher is not very happy with me. I'm not doing a good job promoting <laughs> the book. You should promote it better. Yeah, uh, yeah. Raspberry Pi. Good job, book. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Stephen, for presenting your cool project here. Yeah, yeah. And also thanks for the audience and for the very interactive questions. Yeah. yeah.